candle each Sunday morning on our worship center as a symbol as we are reminded of Christ, the light of the world, being in our midst. It comes as a part of our tradition, as one of the symbols we have of light, light coming into darkness. Uh, and, and it is in, meant to be an um, object for us to be reminded of the metaphors of our faith, of what is going on in our own lives, and it is an opportunity for us to uh, be inspired and to have illumination and understanding be a part of our faith. We also remember that in the words of gospel writers, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And so this light is uh, not something that is static because when it's extinguished necessarily at the end of our worship service, the light does not go out. We take the light with us. We are the light as we go out into the world to bring illumination, comfort, joy, uh, and, and uh, uh, a care and symbols of our faith to people um, who are with us. And, 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 and uh, uh, that's how that functions for us. I welcome you to Bloom in the Desert Ministries, United Church of Christ, and Reconciling Ministries Congregation. We are doing our best to live up to the modern motto of the United Church of Christ, which says, whoever you are and wherever you are on the journey of faith, you are welcome here. We are people who um, are doing our best to give life to words and not ban them. We are people who are doing our best to uh, be real about the welcome that we say uh, that we offer, the extravagant welcome of the United Church of Christ. Uh, and so it is clear that we know that we come from a wide variety of backgrounds and perspectives and understandings, that we have many different experiences, uh, that have preceded the time of our gathering, even on this day. We've come from many different uh, uh, experiences, even this morning. And we know that members of our congregation are going through many different experiences. Some of them are here and some of them are not. And so we join together in spirit as a group on Sunday morning. And we know that in that realm, people love one another in various ways and marry and couple so that we welcome people who are straight and gay and bisexual. We know that in God's creation, there are many different colors, maybe more than Joseph's multicolored coat, so that we welcome people who are black and white and red and yellow and brown and of mixed race and mixed ethnic origins. We know that there are people who are um, in gender identity uh, in ways that are um, uh, uh, also not banned words, and so we welcome people who are transgender. And guess I got pretty upset about that. Yeah. <laughs> and cisgender, gender non-conforming, and uh, uh, non-gender specific. And we welcome you and one another people of faith, people of no faith, people from a wide variety of denominational backgrounds. So in that way, we are people who have an, un, uh, an understanding that there is diversity in life uh, and in the sciences of life. I encourage you to read hearts and minds and strength and soul together into this place for worship as people have done for eons. We bring them for the worship of God and the care of one another in community. The season of preparation is half complete, and today we light the third candle of our wreath. It is pink to remind us to rejoice. In the midst of all the parties and merriment, we are seeking true joy in the arms of the one who comes to bring it. Even as night continues to lengthen, we sense the coming of light that will brighten our days. We rejoice in the anointed one who came and who comes. With joy-filled hearts, we join the energy of our lives to the life whose birth we anticipate. With Christ, we too will bring good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
For us, God has replaced our mourning with the oil of gladness. So, we light this third candle and name it Joy. Please rise as you are able and join with me in reading the responsive call to worship. Sing aloud, sons and daughters. Shout with joyful praise. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, we will say rejoice. The God of justice and salvation is near at hand. Our Redeemer is in our midst. With clouds of hope, we sing to God. Again, we sing rejoice. Make known God's deeds. Proclaim God's love for all to hear. With hearts of laughter we love. Again we say rejoice. Together we make this a holy place, a place of compassion. Shalom, salam, hiyan, paz, peace, amen. Let us pray this intimate prayer speaking from our hearts. At times, it is getting more difficult for us to keep our attention on justice or compassion. Our lives get distracted by many worries, shouting and gifting. Yes, we know these are meant to be fun, but we exhaust and rest and sleep. The cries of those who need are heard, but we are overwhelmed by the need. It seems like too much for us to do, so I get involved. We are very thankful for the persons who are able to get out there and do something. Let's make our hearts and spirits time. God let's understand that you do not ask us to fix everything that you have Rather, you provoke we find a simple way to lighten someone's burden, and you give light to our lives. You inspire hope and offer peace. Help us rejoice in the wonder of creation you in us. Teach us to use our gifts for the common good, so that in helping we find meaningful love and abundant joy. In the holiday spirit, we pray for it. With tender care, dear God, hear now our silent prayers. The silent prayers, let the people say, Amen. 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 Theologian Karl Barth reminds us, joy is the simplest form of gratitude. Amen. 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 Let us now receive the word. Good morning. As you know, today is the second Sunday of Advent. Joy. Third. Third. Oh, you're selling a second. I'm reading what's in the book. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Oops. Um, today's Hebrew scripture reading comes to us from, I lost myself, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through, I lost myself again. It's not on here. Oh, well. Sorry. The spirit of exalted Yahweh is upon me, for Yahweh has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to those who are poor, to heal broken hearts, to proclaim release to those held captive and liberation to those in prison, to announce a year of favor from Yahweh and the day of God's vindication, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to give them a wreath of flowers instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of tears, a cloak of praise instead of despair. They will be known as trees of integrity, planted by Yahweh to display God's glory. They will restore the ancient ruins and rebuild sites long devastated. They will repair the ruined cities neglected for generations. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading. Oh, 
chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and 19 through 28. Then came one named John, sent as an envoy from God, who came as a witness to testify about the light, so that through his testimony everyone might believe. He himself wasn't the light. He only came to testify about the light the true light that illumines all humankind. Now the temple authorities sent emissaries from Jerusalem, priests and Levites, to talk to John. Who are you? they asked. This is John's testimony. He didn't refuse to answer, but freely admitted, I am not the Messiah. Who are you then? they asked. Elijah? No, I am not. He replied, Are you the prophet? No, he replied. Finally they said to him, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? John said, I am, as Isaiah prophesied, the voice of someone crying out in the wilderness, make straight our God's road. The emissaries were members of the Pharisee sect. They questioned him further. If you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, then why are you baptizing people? John said, I baptize with water because among you stands someone who you do not recognize, the one who is to come after me, the strap of whose sandal I am unworthy to untie. This <laughs> occurred in Bethany, across the Jordan River, where J John was baptizing. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our minds that the Holy Spirit might enter as we hear the word, as we know thee in this time, 
In this they ask in thy name. Amen. <clears throat> Today's title is Joy. A word that graces many of the cards we call holiday cards. We find it hard to find a cards in this season of joy and excitement that do not to say have a happy holiday or holidays or enjoy the season. Or may the season penetrate your darkness of the year and promise new light, excitement, and joy in the new year. That despite this flicker of hope and excitement celebrated with parties and potlucks and concerts and heavy traffic, all will pass and we will again enter another 365 days until the next round of cards, good wishes, and a few moments forgetting who we are, where we are, and who our caretaker is. Let us look behind all this and ask our deepest selves, what is the joy that we talk so freely about? And the TV shows hammer away and the, on their Hallmark channel. If you take the Hallmark version of the TV drama, is a lonely, good-looking woman goes to a small town where she once lived. Lots of snow, Christmas trees. A woman usually has some kind of a seasonal job decorating, cooking, or running a business or some other thing. The woman usually has a doesn't wait, forget, don't forget, she has a wise father, a docile mother, and a handsome man with western ruggedness, with a shadow beard, usually alone or in serious relationship with another sort, a beautiful woman with a hard edge, overbearing mother, wimpy father, and the man and woman are engaged, or at least appear to be. End of the story. New woman gets in some kind of embarrassing situation, knocking over the Christmas tree, sound, spilling the soup, or bumping someone in the street falls in love with the original man, or at least dumps the jerk with a society-type mother, and they fall in love. The two misfits, they get married, they live in complete joy. Hallmark sells joy as an everlasting fairy tale with no trouble or thought. To get very going today, I just want to remind you that apathy is not joy, or is it destructive, or is it sadness. Apathy is, I don't give a damn about anything except myself. You will hear in the story I'm about to relate, there will be all elements. There will be joy, there will be apathy, there will be wonder, and there will be things you have to ask Kevin to remind you and to interpret for you later. <laughs> but the story I want to relate to you is position of defining, or at least challenges us, I hope, to think, what is joy? When you really talk about that word, what does it mean to us? Where does it come from? Where is it going? Even the Webster Dictionary has difficulty with it. There are two sides in this story. One leaves us in a quandary of the idea and experience of joy, and the other leaves us wondering if we really have the proper joy. This story is written in the pre-1930s, before the Depression. A few of us remember, and most of us were affected by that in the aftermath of that moment in history. And we all excited about the religious and political challenges and ideas of that decade. But that's a sermon that Kevin will have to deliver later. <laughs> the main character in this story is a small man, maybe middle-aged. But I'm going to use poetic license in telling this story because that is a written as it is written, we have only a partial skeleton of what is to needs to be fleshed out. It's like when we're digging for early man and we find a frontal lobe, and next thing we know he was 10 feet tall, had a huge face, a handsome man, and he was a strong man and bossed his woman around. We all know that from the one bone we find. So that's the way this story is going to be. We have the frontal lobe. But what if we're in a partial scale we're going to flesh out much may be factual and what might not be is not the problem here. We are challenged in this story to find out what is joy. The middle-aged or not so young man was unknown, kept a low profile, <coughs> hated or at least avoided confrontation whenever possible. He minded his own business, blended into the woodwork, was decent, moral, and clean cut, but not so extreme that he would stand up or even be remembered a few days after his funeral. He was putting along his life and his non-entity, and as, as it happens so often, God says, Hey you, I have a job for you to do. Yes, you. I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them their wickedness is sickening to me, and in 40 days I will destroy them. 
I will rain down judgment, and they in their wicked ways of not treating the orphan and the widow with respect and aid, their wickedness of gouging the poor and seeking ever more wealth and greed and power, hungry destruction of all that stands for decent humanity. I am sick of their pride, of their self-indulgence, as they claim to be greater and more and superior to all. I detest, I detest their treatment of persons, filling their jails and bullying all other nations with threats and bombing and senseless destruction. I am peeled at the destruction of all that I have created because of their self-indulged fantasy that the earth and all its riches are to serve their wicked and self-aggrandizing inflated concept and related to the rest of creation. Go now and tell them, I, God, have sent you, and they will perish at my hand and at my leisure in 40 days. Our frightened, non-confrontational, little, middle, self-satisfied, secure, joyful man runs away. But due to some unforeseen difficulties that God brings about as he does such behavior, he relents. And God says, yes, you. Now go and do what I have told you to do. He goes. He delivers the message. And now he begins to feel something that he has never felt before. He feels that he's accomplished something. He will be recognized. He is proud and he is semi-puffed up. He sees himself as important. He has brought about the great message and he survives. He is important. His status as a person has brought the message of destruction because of the city's wickedness and the thousands of people and cattle will be destroyed. And he is privy to that and has been the reporter and the agent of that destruction. He is no longer a nobody. He is no longer unknown. He is no longer weak. He is no longer non-confrontational. He is filled with a new and overpowering feeling of joy. The residents of the city of Nineveh repent, and the leader of the great city repents and decrees that all shall repent and give up their wicked ways in hope that God will hear them, even though technically, technically, they are not his people. He will give them a new chance and will relent from his judgment. God sees this and pulls back his judgment. Our little now puffed up man says in anger, let me die. It would be better to be dead than alive and to be back to nothing again. He said, oh, this, oh Lord, is what I feared when I was in my own country, comfortable and unruffled. To forestall it, I escaped to Tarshish, but I knew that thou art a God of gracious and compassionate, long suffering, ever constant, always willing to repent of disaster. Translated. <laughs> How come you have to be so soft and let these people get away with all their wickedness? God says, you're angry? Well, there is always hope that God will bend to our will. There is always hope that God will give us the joy we so seek, so we so desperately seek, and will destroy those evil, wicked people that need to be punished. Our man goes out on a hill, puts up a temporary shelter, gets his out his fold-up lounge chair, lays back to watch the destruction of the city as he has delivered the message to. The sun is hot. God in his great kindness grows up a gourd that shades the wee little man as he comfortably awaits God's judgment and destruction. You can imagine he has a large iced tea, a bit of popcorn and brownies to watch the fireworks. He is filled with joy. But come morning, God, as always says joy, sends a worm in the night, eats off the gourd, and the Santa Anne's wind blow hot upon this little man, and he says, he really gets P.O.'d, and God says, you're angry. Then God says, why are you more concerned about a gourd, which you had nothing to do with? You didn't even plant it. You didn't water it. You didn't even bring the seed. And were you more than concerned about the gourd, and you're about thousands of people and many cattle? What about the joy of these people? What about the joy that these people experience in the fact they have turned from their wicked ways and now have life? They have found real joy. God said, should I not be sorry for them and happy for them that they have joy? We are offered two definitions of examples of joy in this story. We live in that dilemma. On one hand, do we claim to be the people of justice mercy, love, acceptance, and constantly work for these things. We claim to be the people that Isaiah has said, God will free the captive, will bring the good news to the humble, will bind up the brokenhearted, 
There will be oil of gladness instead of mourner's tears and a garment of splendor for the heavy heart. Although the oil part bothers me. This is the description of joy that Isaiah gives us. Which of the two examples of joy do we see in this pre-1930 story in the proclamation by Isaiah? We have joy present with us, but it cannot be purchased. It cannot be coerced. It is ours, but we must choose. And John the Baptist is a question by a group sent by the religious leaders to find out who he was. I know how that feels. I preached in Bozeman. I stood at the back greeting the people, and this little old man comes in and says, Who are you? I said, I don't know. Who are you? Do any of us know who we are? And that's all he found out. But he, John refutes all their expectations, and he said, and their answers them, and ends up saying he is the witness to the light that is to the world. The light that shares in the darkness, and the dark shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot put it out. So we have that joy, but it's us for us to choose. Is it the joy for us, the destruction of those that are not of our culture, of our nation, of our background, of our religion, but evil in our sight? Is that the joy we seek? Is it the joy we seek when the political winds blow our way? Is it the winning the lottery? Is it life? Is it the light that shines in the darkness? What is our joy? It is it the story that we celebrate at this each time of the year? Is it the joy of success, happiness, riches, recognition, and good feelings because we have done our part for God? Now we can get out our lawn chairs and we can watch the results of our good works delivering the message. But what is joy? Is it self-satisfaction? Or even the present, no, ever present knowing that God is there, forgiving, loving, hearing, and everlasting love that is a gift to us, that brings us joy even in the darkest of times. It is a light that cannot be overcome by the darkness. Amen. Will you pray with me? Christ comes, and our hearts are full. Our joy is boundless. Accept this offering as a sign of our abiding love. Use it to bring peace, harmony, and justice to all the world. And let all the people rejoice and give thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Let's reach out and connect with someone near you. Uh, taking a hand, touching elbows, shoulders. And pray together the prayer given to us from, from Jesus using the words most familiar and comforting to you, saying, Our prayers, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.